Good morning. Welcome to the 57th meeting of the National Development Council or the Rashtriya Vikas Parishad. The NDC is chaired by the Prime Minister and it has as its members the Union Cabinet Ministers, Chief Ministers of all states, representatives of Union territories, and a body like this with the highest elected representatives is obviously the highest policy making body in the country at the executive level but it has an advisory role only and approves the five year plans at its last meeting in october 2011 they considered the approach paper to the 12th five year plan that five year plan has now come into effect from the 1st of april this year and at the last meeting that's the 56th meeting they looked at six important areas determining the state level five-year plans mobilization of resources priority to agriculture management of energy resources management of water resources improving the implementation on the ground well the planning commission has scaled down the growth target to eight percent for the current plan for the plan period of 2012 to 2017 of the 12th five-year plan it was 8.2 percent and initially it was actually nine percent the gross budgetary support for this plan is 35.68 lakh crore rupees or 5.23 percent of GDP and today at this meeting they are likely to discuss a scheme for restoration of justice for rape victims as well in the context of the grave crimes against women in our society it will also appropriately address the perception of discrimination and alienation among the Muslim community that's Mr. Rangaswamy there the Chief Minister of Puducherry Mr. Thara Chand is the Deputy Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir And at the back, we can see representatives of each state. The chief ministers are sitting in front. We did, in fact, just see Mr. Manik Sarkar a little while ago from Tripura. One of the longest serving chief ministers. Here's Tarun Gogoi, again, one of the longest serving chief ministers in the country, in his 12th year in office, in fact. And next to him is Nitish Kumar the very popular Chief Minister of Bihar in his eighth year in office currently part of his second term and that's the Delhi Chief Minister Sheila Dixit also one of the popular Chief Ministers who's serving her third term Ashok Gelot, Chief Minister of Rajasthan. And this is an opportunity, in fact, for all the elected leaders at the highest executive level of each state to meet and interact and to build a sort of consensus as far as planning is concerned this is a collaborative approach the NDC was first set up by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru it was done way back in fact in 1952 and it's had 56 meetings so far this is the 57th meeting And planning too has gone through a considerable process of change. Present here are all the members of the planning commission as well, secretaries of all the departments of the union government, chief secretaries of states along with their chief ministers. This is Mr. Shivraj Singh Chauhan, the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh. 
is serving his eighth year in office. This is Mr. Prithviraj Chavan, the Chief Minister of Maharashtra. He's in his third year in office. And that is Pavan Kumar Chamling we saw there just a short while ago. In fact, he is the longest serving chief minister in the country. The chief minister of Sikkim has been in office for 18 years and the prime minister has arrived. the Agriculture Minister, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, the Finance Minister, the Defence Minister, and the Minister of State for Planning as well. Namaskar, good morning and swagatam. It is now my privilege in requesting the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, to kindly welcome our Honorable Chief Ministers and distinguished members of the National Development Council. Respected Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh Ji, Honorable Minister for Defense, Sri K. Anthony Ji, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Sri Sharad Pawar Ji, Honorable Finance Minister, Sri P. Chidambaram Ji, Honorable Home Minister, Sri Shushil Kumar Shinde Ji, Honorable Minister of State for Planning, Sri Rajiv Shukla Ji, Union Cabinet Ministers, Chief Ministers and Finance Ministers of the States, other distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin by thanking the Prime Minister on behalf of all members of the Planning Commission for calling this meeting of the NDC to discuss the draft 12th plan. I also thank the Chief Ministers for their presence here. Since we are all keenly awaiting the Prime Minister's inaugural address, I will be very brief. In preparing the document that is before you, we were guided by the directions given by the NDC when it considered the approach paper over a year ago. We have also engaged in wide-ranging consultations with state governments, both individually through the process of annual plan discussions and also in groups through regional meetings. I thank all chief ministers and state delegations for the time they spent in these consultations and the inputs they gave us. We have also consulted with many other stakeholders, including a very large number of civil society organizations. Plan discussions often tend to focus on plan programs, their funding arrangements, and their performance in terms of expenditure. These are indeed important issues, but the end result we want must be seen in terms of the impact of these programs on the ground. Both the center and the states must therefore subject programs to a vigorous performance audit. More broadly, the outcome we want in terms of improving the living standards of the Aam Admi depends not only on plan programs but on the performance of the economy as a whole in terms of the pace of economic growth, its sectoral composition, the pace of employment generation and the spread of income earning opportunities across different categories of the population and regions. These outcomes depend on what happens to investment and also the productivity of investment. Public sector investment is about 25% of total investment in the economy and the other 75% consists of private investment which covers the household sector including small firms and farms and also investment by the private corporate sector. It follows that both the center and the states need to focus on policies that will promote these different components of investment and also increase their efficiency. In analyzing policy options, we have distinguished between areas of policy intervention that are largely in the hands of the center 
and those that are largely in the hands of the states. We find that while much of what needs to be done in the 12th plan has to be done by the center, a great deal has to be done and can be done at the state level. We also find that many states are taking innovative steps in several areas, which is why growth over the past 10 years has been high and also regionally well dispersed. We need to spread knowledge of best practice wherever we find it. The 12th plan is unique in one sense, and that is that unlike previous plans, it does not present a single growth projection. Instead, it recognizes that growth outcomes will depend upon the extent to which we are able to take the difficult policy decisions needed to generate inclusive growth. In this context, the plan identifies an aspirational scenario number one called strong inclusive growth, in which the economy is projected to grow at about 8.2% per year based on successful policy interventions at multiple leverage points which will generate virtuous circles. Scenario two is one where policies move broadly in the right direction but are not fully implemented. In this case, growth will be limited to between six and six and a half percent with correspondingly lower progress on inclusiveness. The plan also refers to a third scenario which is described as policy logjam. This is the scenario where there is very little progress on the difficult different decisions identified. In this case, growth will be stuck between five and five and a half percent and inclusiveness performance will also be very poor. The plan document emphasizes that scenario one is the only scenario that will meet the aspirations of the people. Before finalizing the plan document, we need to take account of two recent developments. First, the estimates of GDP growth in 2012-13 presented by the Finance Ministry to Parliament a few days ago have been revised downwards to between 5.7 and 5.9 percent, reflecting the latest assessment of growth prospects in the current year. Second, the latest assessment about global economic pros uh, prospects released by the UN a few days ago suggests that the global economy will be significantly weaker in 2013 than was projected earlier and recovery thereafter will be slow at best. In view of these two developments, the growth rate associated with scenario one needs to be revisited. It should perhaps be scaled down to 8%. I would like to emphasize that achieving an average of 8% over five years, following a growth of say 5.8% in the first year, and say something over 7% in the second year, will still involve a very sharp acceleration in the last three years of the plan. The scenario therefore remains very ambitious regarding achievements and the modification proposed is only a recognition of reality. We will incorporate suitable modification in the text to reflect this adjustment. Finally, let me refer to an issue frequently raised by chief ministers relating to the need to restructure centrally sponsored schemes. The BK Chaturvedi Committee has looked into this issue and has held extensive discussions with state governments. The committee made a number of recommendations. Based on these recommendations, it is proposed to consolidate centrally sponsored schemes into a smaller number and also to increase the degree of flexibility in the guidelines under which these schemes operate. It is also proposed to introduce a special flexi fund window within each flagship scheme which will give states freedom to experiment and innovate even beyond the flexible guidelines. We expect to implement the new system with effect from April 1, 2013. I believe these changes will go a long way to meet the demands of Chief Ministers. I now request the Prime Minister to address this gathering.
my cabinet colleagues, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Honorable Chief Ministers of States, members of the Planning Commission, members of state delegations, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I have great pleasure in welcoming you to this meeting of the National Development Council to consider the draft 12th five-year plan. The draft that is before you presents a comprehensive assessment of the many challenges our country faces in achieving the plan objective of faster, more inclusive and sustainable growth. As we begin our 12th plan journey, it is worth noting that we do so with an economy that has shown many areas of strength. We achieved an average of 7.9% growth in the 11th plan period, despite the fact that there were two global crises in this period. This growth has also been much more inclusive than in the past. The percentage of the population below the official poverty line declined by about two percentage points per year after 2004-05, which is two and a half times faster than the rate of decline between 1993-94 and 2004-2005. This basic finding that poverty declined faster would hold even if the poverty line is revised. Agricultural growth accelerated from 2.4% in the 10th plan to 3.3% in the 11th plan. Real wages in agriculture have grown at 6.8% per year in recent years compared with only 1.1% per year in the period before 2004-05. Better agricultural performance is an important reason why poverty declined faster. States that used to grow slowly in earlier period have done much better. The average growth rate of the five poorest states exceeds the national average for the first time in any planned period. I think we may be reaching this stage when the term Bimaru states can be relegated to history. While these developments indicate the strength of our economy, it is also true that the current economic situation is difficult. The continuing crisis in the global economy has reduced growth everywhere. It is expected to be zero in the Eurozone and Japan and emerging market economies have also slowed down. The global slowdown combined with some drastic domestic constraints has meant that our growth has also slowed down. Our first priority must be to reverse this slowdown. We cannot change the global economy, but we can do something about the domestic constraints which have contributed to the downturn. The most immediate problems we need to tackle are the implementation problems affecting large projects, including particularly power projects which are stuck because of delays in getting clearances and fuel supply agreements. We have taken a number of steps to deal with this problem, including the establishment of a new cabinet committee on investment under my chairmanship. I am confident these steps will have a positive effect, but their full impact will take time. The Deputy Chairman 
has indicated that in view of the latest assessment of the state of the global economy, the overall growth target for the 12th plan is being set at 8%. This is a reasonable modification, but I must emphasize that achieving an average of 8% growth following less than 6% in the first year is still an ambitious target. As the plan document makes clear, the high growth scenario will definitely not materialize if we follow a business as usual policy. The plan identifies a number of areas where new initiatives and policy innovations are needed. Many of these are areas where the principal responsibility is that of the states. I look forward to hearing the views of Honorable Chief Ministers on these suggestions. Ladies and gentlemen, while we need to accelerate growth, we do not view growth as an end in itself. Our real objective must be to improve the condition of lives of the Aam Admi, which is why we emphasize that growth must be inclusive. There are two reasons why rapid growth is necessary to achieve greater inclusiveness. First, it is necessary to generate the revenues to finance our many programs of inclusiveness. If growth slows down, neither the states nor the center will have the resources needed to, to implement inclusiveness programs. We will either be forced to cut these programs or be pushed into tolerating a higher fiscal deficit which will have other negative consequences. Rapid growth also contributes directly to inclusiveness because it provides greater access to income and employment opportunities. Policies aimed at stimulating growth in agriculture and in medium and small industries combined with steps to promote education and skill development will produce a growth process which is inherently more inclusive. The 12th plan strategy contains many elements which will ensure that growth is as inclusive as possible. I welcome your comments on this strategy. We also need to pay special attention to disparities between socio-economic groups such as scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, other backward classes and minorities. These groups lag behind the rest of the population in key socio-economic indicators. Fortunately, the gaps are closing, but the pace at which this is happening is not satisfactory and certainly does not match expectations. We need to consider how we can do better. Gender inequality is another important aspect which deserves special attention. Women and girls represent half the population and our society has not been fair to this half. Their socio-economic status is improving but gaps persist. The emergence of women in public spaces, which is an absolutely essential part of social emancipation, is accompanied by growing threats to their safety and security. I have in mind the brutal attack on a young woman only a few days ago in the capital and other such reprehensible incidents elsewhere. We must reflect on this problem which occurs in all states and regions of our country and which requires greater attention both by the centre and the states. In this particular case, the culprits have been apprehended and the law will deal with them expeditiously. Government has decided to review the present laws 
and examine the levels of punishment in cases of aggravated sexual assault. A committee of eminent jurists headed by the former Chief Justice of India, Justice J.S. Verma, has been constituted for this purpose. Let me state categorically that the issue of safety and security of women is of the highest concern to our government. A commission of inquiry is being set up to look into precisely these issues in the capital. There can be no meaningful development without the active participation of half the population and this participation simply cannot take place if their security and safety are not assured. I urge all chief ministers to pay special attention to this critical area in their states. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many sectors of our economy that are dealt with in detail in the plan document. I will only touch on some of them in my remarks. Agriculture is an area of critical concern. Although the share of agriculture in GDP has fallen to only 15%, about half the population still relies on agriculture as its principal income source. What happens in agriculture is therefore critical for the success of inclusiveness. We need to build on the success of the last plan by increasing land productivity in agriculture so that we not only meet our rising demand for food but also increase incomes of those dependent on agriculture. Paradoxically, we should not aim at increasing total employment in agriculture. In fact, we need to move people out of agriculture by giving them gainful employment in the non-agricultural sector. It is only when fewer people depend upon agriculture that per capita incomes in agriculture will rise significantly and sufficiently to make farming an attractive proposition. Agriculture is a state subject and most of the policy initiatives needed are in the realm of state governments. The Minister of Agriculture, my colleague Shri Sherd Pawar, will be dealing with these issues in some detail and I look forward to the reactions of Chief Ministers on this important subject. Growth in manufacturing should be at double digit levels, but this has yet to take place. The plan mentions many new initiatives aimed at strengthening performance in the manufacturing sector. Small and medium industries are particularly important as they generate more employment. Both the centre and the states must give priority attention to creating an ecosystem in which these industries can grow and flourish. Better infrastructure is the best guarantee for rapid growth of our economy. Infrastructure development is heavily capital intensive and both the centre and the states are severely constrained by resource availability. The central government and many state governments have been successful in promoting infrastructure development through public-private partnerships projects. India has the second largest number of PPP projects in infrastructure in the world. I, it will be necessary to continue this trust in the 12th five-year plan. Ladies and gentlemen, the 11th plan paid special attention to the Northeast and I am happy to say that northeastern states have responded well. GDP growth in a number of states was higher than the national average. We plan to step up the pace of investments in infrastructure, particularly roads, rail, airports, waterways and power transmission system to support and stimulate 
economic activity in this vital region of our country. I am hopeful that as a result of our look east policy, this region will fast become a major gateway to trade and economic activity with our neighbors. I have mentioned that both the center and the states face resource constraints. Both, therefore, have to make determined efforts to mobilize resources to fund the plan. The plan documents points out that we need to increase the tax ratio as a percentage of GDP through a combination of tax reforms and better tax administration. Early implementation of the goods and services tax is critical in this context. I hope we will have the cooperation of the states to introduce the GST as quickly as possible. The plan also draws attention to the need to control subsidies. Some subsidies are normal and indeed essential part of any socially just system and society. But subsidies should be well designed and effectively targeted and the total volume must be kept within limits of fiscal sustainability. Failure to control subsidies within these limits only means that other plan expenditures have to be cut or the fiscal deficit target exceeded. The Finance Minister will be addressing these issues in his intervention. A common complaint against government program is that they suffer from leakages, corruption, delays and poor target. The central government is taking a major step to deal with this problem by shifting several beneficiary-oriented schemes to a direct transfer mode using the Aadhaar platform. This will begin to roll out for selected schemes in selected districts in the course of January 2013. In due course, a wide range of benefits like scholarships for students, pensions for elderly, health benefits, Manrega wages and many other benefits will migrate to direct transfer into bank accounts using Aadhaar as a bridge. This is an innovative step which will be watched by the entire global development community. The central and state governments must work together to make this a success. Many state governments have said that centrally sponsored schemes are often ineffective because of rigid guidelines. The Deputy Chairman has already pointed out that we are taking steps to rationalize the centrally sponsored schemes along the lines recommended by the BK Chaturvedi Committee, including proposals to introduce greater flexibility in these schemes. I am sure these changes will be widely welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two areas I wish to mention which pose a major challenge for our economy and these are energy and water. Energy is a critical input for any growth process and our domestic energy resources are not sufficient to meet our country's growing needs. We import oil, natural gas and in recent years even coal. If we wish to keep our energy import requirements within reasonable limits, we must emphasize energy efficiency to moderate demand and we must increase domestic production of energy. Energy pricing is critical for both objectives. If domestic energy prices are too low, there will be no incentive to increase energy efficiency or to expand even supplies. Unfortunately, energy is underpriced in our country. Our coal, petroleum products and natural gas are all priced well below international prices. 
This also means that electricity is effectively underpriced, especially for some consumers. Immediate adjustment of prices to close the gap is not feasible. I realize this, but some phase price adjustment is necessary. Energy experts are unanimous that we cannot expect to achieve rapid, inclusive and sustainable growth if we are not willing to undertake a phased adjustment in energy prices to bring them in line with world prices. The central government and the states must work together to create awareness in the public that we must limit the extent of energy subsidies. I look forward to hearing the comments of Honorable Chief Ministers to this complex issue. The management of our water resources poses severe challenges. We are rapidly approaching the position where the total demand for water in the country simply cannot be met by available supplies. As with energy, we have to respond by increasing water use efficiency and also by expanding supply in a sustainable manner. The plan document outlines a comprehensive strategy for dealing with this problem, starting with a serious effort to map available groundwater supplies aquifer by aquifer. Available water also needs to be allocated to different uses through a water regulatory authority. This is an area where action lies largely in the domain of state governments. Ladies and gentlemen, the development of our country is necessarily a cooperative endeavor involving many stakeholders. It involves both the public sector and the private sector, the central government and the state government. It also involves the common people, particularly those participating actively in devising new ways of addressing old problems. We have been reasonably successful in what we have achieved so far, but we must remember that we are still a low-income country. We need 20 years of rapid growth to bring it to middle-income level. The journey is long and requires hard work and commitment. This meeting of the National Development Council is an opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the arduous task lying before us. The people of this country has bestowed upon us the responsibility of creating the conditions in which they can fulfill their dreams and aspirations. If we do our part, I have no doubt that the talented people of India have the capacity to take this great nation to heights of glory. The people have high expectations of us. I am sure all chief ministers will agree that we must not fail to come up to the expectations of our peoples. I thank you.